thank you all for coming. I'm Lisa Ludwig, Executive Director of Lower Eastern Shore Heritage Council, and welcome to my party. <laughs> This is a great day and we're really excited everyone's here. We're going to honor a lot of people and eat a lot of great food and bid on a lot of great silent auction items. I'll be stopping in periodically to give you a heads up. Make sure you're shopping the silent auction. Remember, what you bid on you get to take home and the proceeds stay with Lesh, which is really important. So right now I'm going to turn this over to our board president, Dr. Ernie Boger, our master of ceremonies today, and give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I guess, been unleashed by uh, Lisa, so let me get busy here. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the 17th annual edition of the Lower Eastern Shore Heritage Council Luncheon Meeting and Heritage Awards Ceremony. That's a mouthful, but we're going to be doing a lot of things here today. I am Dr. Ernest P. Boger, Chairman, Department of Hospitality and Tourism Management at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, Hawk Pride. Uh, more importantly for today, I stand before you as president of the Lower Eastern Shore Heritage Area Council, or LESH, for 2017. Let me welcome you also to uh, this legendary uh, Wacomico Youth and Civic Center. As we all know, this is the preeminent venue for, in our heritage area for events and occasions of this magnitude. So we're delighted to be able to experience uh, this facility here today. Uh, let's see, I also want to recognize uh, uh, Chad Butterbau, who is Executive Director of Maryland Traditions. <laughs> and um, our keynote speaker, Edwin uh, Remsberg, that you will uh, get to know a bit about later on. But uh, we also want you to stop by our recent mini grant recipients, the displays in the back there. The four today represent a disbursement of $10,000 from the Lesh operating budget and a match of uh, 10,000 from the organizations for a total economic impact of $20,000. These four are the Lower Shore Land Trust, the uh, Salisbury Art Space, the Astatigue Allen Alliance, and the Ward Museum of Waterfowl Art. Uh, while we're talking about grants and economic impact, you should be impressed to know that the Maryland Heritage Authority dispersed almost $2.7 million in support of heritage area projects uh, statewide. Our area received uh, around 200,000 of that amount, uh, which is uh, pretty much our, our, our fair share because we, we always like to get more, but uh, that's in the general neighborhood of 10% uh, or so. And there were 13 uh, heritage areas, so you know, if you do your mathematics there, that gives us slightly more than what would be our fair share if you divided it by 13. <laughs> uh, but those, the, um, the um, Organizations that uh, receive those funds are the Delmarva uh, Discovery Center and Museum, uh, the um, <clears throat> Radcliffe House, the uh, uh, Skipjack Heritage Museum, and uh, Lesh itself in terms of some of our management grant funds. We actually need to um, uh, uh, kind of uh, give, I think, a, a, a resounding a uh, piece of applause here, uh, not just yet, but to recognize the fact that as I understand that the state legislature in recent, in recent session unanimously agreed to raise the um, MDHA award ceiling from three million to six million dollars in the coming year or years. Um, yes. <clears throat> Uh, there may be some more I's to dot and T's to cross, but as I understand it, it's a done deal. Uh, so hooray for our legislators again. Uh, how about a few more figures to highlight the historic and continuing economic impact of LESH on the immediate tri-county geographic area? In terms of investment by the Maryland Heritage Area Authority, um, LESH leveraged through, through LESH uh, for the three counties. Uh, whereas we look at, as we're looking <clears throat> at uh, the year 2008 through 2016, uh, we're looking at 
an impact of $1,100,392. Now, of course, you know all of uh, these funds require a match, so you can kind of double that. And that brings that to $2,200,784. And then when you double it again for economic impact, it works out to $4,401,568. So I think we should give ourselves a hand for that nice figure. Um, economic impact over the past uh, eight years of the uh, LESH operation and activities. <clears throat> and let's see. Um, oh, yes, our room today contains a countless number of volunteers and nonprofits coming together to honor the region's special assets and traditions. We particularly thank our council volunteers and sponsors who are listed on the recognition board and, of course, in the printed souvenir program. We call it a souvenir program because we know you will take it with you uh, in order to. Uh, uh, Remember and recognize those who uh, came to uh, the front and supported uh, the effort here today. <clears throat> I'd like now to uh, ask, uh, as a time, yeah, Reverend Weaver of the Remedy Church to come forth and give us a blessing for the occasion and the food. Uh, while he's coming up, I want to recognize another very special blessing uh, in the personage of Mr. and Mrs. Donna Ludwig who are celebrating their 63rd wedding anniversary this week. Would you please stand? Uh, you, you just might recognize the surname, I'm not sure, but these are indeed the proud parents of our own precious Lesh Executive Director, Ms. Lisa Ludwig. More applause. And I recently learned that Mr. Ludwig has some serious cultural heritage bona fides uh, as a folk art, uh, as a folk art uh, woodcarver. And I'm uh, pleased to have at least have one of his items in my own personal collection. So thought I'd share that with you here today. Uh, <coughs> Reverend Weaver. This is, I believe, the fourth time I have been with you here and honored to uh, pray over our meal and our time together. And every year that I'm given this opportunity, I just want to start by saying what an honor it is to stand with you and remember the heritage that is the Eastern Shore and that is ours to entrust to future generations. My son Ryland it will be writing an article from today. He's been asked uh, to be a reporter. so. He may uh, be on the prowl and uh, asking for comments at some point. So don't be alarmed if a 10-year-old asks you some questions at some point. Um, and he'll be hopefully sharing those with our local newspapers. And we'll see if we can continue promoting the work of Lesh, especially uh, the new application uh, on iTunes that you have celebrated there. Last year, I highlighted that uh, in my uh, pre-prayer talk, uh, my pep talk, right? Um, and so I want to say again, now you have a reminder, a bookmark to carry with you, and we use that quite often when we travel um, on the Eastern Shore to look at different uh, heritage sites, and we hope that you can share that with those who use smartphones, especially um, younger children who might uh, benefit from that, because so often our history is uh, something on the side of the road that we drive by with a little plaque that we don't stop and look at, and that application makes it real and live in the hands of children. So something to touch, something tangible, and it's very good. So share that, please. All right, let's pray. That's what I'm here for. Let's do that. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather here in this space. Uh, we are honored by the heritage that you have handed off to us, and may we continue the process, the work, of investing in everything that you have entrusted to us with generosity and hope and love, May we look with fresh eyes at the land and the environment around us. May we see clearly how we might protect, conserve the bay, the Atlantic, and this peninsula in which we have been planted. We look expectantly to what comes next, and we ask you to give us encouragement today that we might step forth once again into this work, so many of us engaged in the work of conservancy. 
And so we ask you for that encouragement today. And we also ask your blessing over the food that we consume and for those who prepared this food and those who put work into this banquet. Thank you for all of these things and so much more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> okay, let's uh, start this uh, part of the program by um, introducing the um, members of the uh, Lesh Board of Directors. Uh, since I'm standing up here, I guess I'll start with myself. Uh, I'm Ernest Boger, representing Somerset County. Uh, also representing Somerset County is Mindy Begoyne, Ann Dura G, Carolyn Fitzgerald, Duke Marshall, who serves as Secretary, Danny Thompson, Gail Yerges, Julie Woodison, and that's the group for Somerset County. Moving on to uh, to uh, West County, I've got Dr. Cynthia Bird, who serves also as our Vice President, Sandy Hurley, and Hillier, Glenn Irving, who serves as our Treasurer, Mona Margarita. Kate Patton, Patrick Wolf, and Ivy Wells, representing Worcester County. <laughs> and Wicomico, Geraldine Bell, Sylvia Bradley, Matt Crema, Alita Davis, John Hall, John Lennox, who's our immediate past president, William Wilson, and Lee Whaley for Wicomico County. We also want to recognize uh, Lisa Challenger, who serves on the, um, the Heritage Authority Board and uh, is also a uh, founding member of LESH and serves, uh, as noted in your program here, as an ex officio member of the board. Lisa Challenger, where are you? Lisa, thank you. And certainly we want to recognize, again, we can't recognize her too much, Lisa Ludwig, our executive director. And now, of course, the moment you've all been waiting for was the presentation of the 2017 Lesh Annual Heritage uh, Award winners. So starting with the Best New Heritage Initiative. This award recognizes programs, events, or products that represent new initiatives achieved in the last year by an individual or organization that educates the public by expanding understanding of or access to the area's rich heritage. The idea for this unique project that's going to be honored today created much initial excitement and in reality it has exceeded all expectations. Uh, the, this exhibit is significant since the mammals featured hint, hint, there are indicative of the environmental health of our region. They have up to a 50 mile range which has been greatly reduced in some areas due to habitat loss over harvesting and pollution. Most people on the shore have not seen them in their natural habitat. They're often referred to as one of the hidden wonders. Mac and Tuck, hint, hint, the playful residents of this new exhibit have helped launch their host site into a regional tourist destination. They continue to captivate guests, volunteers, and staff alike. This impressive exhibit was partially funded by a Maryland Heritage Area Authority grant, a state bond bill, and a very generous gift in memory of the late Wally Gordon. As a result of much research and travels to other zoos and aquariums, Mac and Tuck, Mac and Tuck, natives of Louisiana, have the best possible environment and are thriving in their new home. Ladies and gentlemen, the Best New Heritage Initiative Award for 2017 goes to the Delmarva Discovery Center River Otter Exhibit. Please come forward. Sorry, I have to lower the mic. My name is Stacy Wisner. I'm the president and CEO of the Delmarva Discovery Center Museum. We have quite a few board members here today. We're all so proud of this exhibit. If you've not been to the Discovery Center in the last year and a half, you're not going to believe it. Um, this quarter million dollar river otter exhibit has a 6,000 gallon aquarium, 
a 38-foot land area, and McIntuck have a waterfall they like to slide down. We also have a handicap accessible touch pool with four wheelchair stations. Um, and we just want you all to come. Just come take a visit. We specialize in field trips and all. And we really, really appreciate everything the Maryland Heritage Area has done and Lash and Lisa. Uh, we appreciate you all so much. Thank you very much. When I first heard about it, they told me they were named Mac and Cheese. And I said, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> and, and sure enough, it was not Mac and Cheese, but that's what I was told first time. Okay, the next award, the Heritage Tourism Program Event. This award recognizes an outstanding heritage event, annual, special, or ongoing lecture series or other type of program that makes local heritage come alive. It does not necessarily take place at a historic site, but must have taken place within the past three years. A heritage program event informs, educates, and or celebrates some aspect of local heritage. Picture in your mind, 800 folk celebrating a milestone in Westover, Maryland, with a history tent housing a variety of groups, including the Knapp Center for Del Marva History and Culture, the Ward Museum of Waterfowl Art, local churches, and other organizations with free, I say free, Smith Island cake, hmm, <laughs> hot dogs, hmm, <laughs> drinks, <laughs> commemorative coin, and an anniversary booklet given to all attendees. This perfect day was capped off with fireworks in the evening and music by Dark Gold Jazz, courtesy of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. The people from far and wide attended the celebration, including a family from Norway. Yes, hmm. All agreed that the event was a huge success. Participants remembered those who stood firm in the 17th century so that Somerset County could exist in modern times. The inclusion of stories from various cultural groups in Old Somerset gave modern day visitors a better sense of place as all celebrated our heritage. Uh, for 2017, the award for Heritage Tourism event goes to the 350th anniversary of Somerset County. Accepting the award are Julie Whittison, uh, Clint Sterling, and Suzanne Todd Smith. Please come forward. And Dan Powers also, please come forward. And so each one accepts awards for 100 years and then somebody for 50. They have to work with that and tell you how that works. But, you know, we've got 350 years, we have to have a lot of people accepting awards. Uh, thank you. On, on behalf of uh, our committee, uh, the Somerset County Commissioners and the citizens of Somerset County, uh, we're honored by this award. Um, so many uh, folks that made that this day happen. Uh, just to recognize a few that are here today, obviously, um, Suzanne Smith, uh, Gail Yerges, and Carolyn Fitzgerald from the Somerset County Historic Trust, um, Paul Tewart, who was the author of our commemorative book that was given out, uh, Ann Dorgie, uh, Clint Sterling, our Park and Rec's director, um, Dr. Bell, and, and UMES, uh, and Mr. Walter Woods, who was an integral part of uh, our committee, uh, Wendy Robertson from uh, Tourism, and also uh, the state representatives that were present uh, to help celebrate with us. It was really great uh, to have uh, Delegate Carrozza, Delegate Otto, and Delegate Anderton, who is a uh, Somerset County native, uh, as you all are aware. Uh, Senator Mathias was there also, and also Wicomico County Executive Bob Culver joined us. As everybody knows, Worcester, Wicomico, and Somerset all used to be Somerset County at one point <laughs> in the very beginning. So it was great to have all three counties come together to celebrate Somerset County, and it was a great day. Thank you. Moving on to award number three, the Heritage Interpreter of the Year. This award recognizes an individual who is a heritage interpreter, docent, educator, tour guide, volunteer in a nonprofit or for profit heritage organization who provides outstanding factual and educational information to the public. Our award recipient is a highly skilled, personal, willing individual who dedicates his time to docent work at the Ward Museum of Waterfowl Art. 
He skillfully accommodates museum guests of all ages, from the smallest children to their great-grandparents. He is adept at capturing the attention of diverse groups and holding it with facts and historical information relative to art, tradition, and nature. As a docent, he is a careful listener who is able to quickly identify how people learn and in what way they may be most interested. He also volunteers at special events, among them the Ward World Competition, the Chesapeake Waterfowl Expo, and the Art and Nature Photo Festival. Our awardee has the unique ability to manage his responsibilities with diplomacy and grace, regardless of how difficult the task may be. At large events, he serves as the primary event greeter, a job that demands a volunteer who can gain the confidence of first-time guests and make them feel like the Ward Museum is their own. Since making Salisbury his home, he has dedicated himself to selfless service and generosity to benefit the community. In addition to his work at the Ward Museum, he has been recognized for his stellar public service with Coastal Hospice and the Salisbury Zoo. At this time, we'd like to recognize the 2017 Heritage Interpreter of the Year awardee, and that goes to Mr. Walt McKay. Please come forward. Well, thank you all very much for this uh, beautiful award. I greatly appreciate it, and I greatly appreciate what the Heritage Council does for us down here on the Eastern Shore. Also, I want to invite you all to the Ward Museum. We just completed this past weekend our World Championship of Carvers, a great event we had, and now we have some new pieces of art to see. So please join us over at the Ward Museum. You all know where it is, right downtown right down here in the, near, near the, um, well, near Parkside High School. Uh, just around the corner, actually. So come join us. We'd love to have you come. Take care. And that brings us to the Heritage Award, the Heritage Award. <clears throat> This award recognizes an individual or organization for significant and long-lasting contributions to the community by interpreting, preserving, promoting, researching, and or supplementing local history and heritage. Our award recipient has been working in Somerset, Wicomico, and Worcester County since 1983. He has worked diligently with great attention to detail on preservation projects on Maryland's lower eastern shore. Preservation in the three counties would not be where it is today without his devotion and service. In the interest of time, I will not note all of his accomplishments, but uh, we will cite a few. During his 39 years of work since graduating from the University of Delaware, he has conducted six intensive level historic structure surveys. These major projects, along with a number of smaller surveys, have involved the documentation and research of more than 2,000 historic properties. Five of the surveys have been published. The Somerset, Worcester, and Wacomico County inventory volumes have been honored with the Antoinette Downing Award for Excellence in Published Architectural Surveys, an award conferred by the Society for Architectural Historians. He has served as a private architectural historian to implement historic property research on a county scale, in addition to a host of smaller projects, including architectural and historical research for restoration projects numerous National Register nominations, and other historic and architectural planning documents. He has served as a consultant on many large-scale restoration projects, including the Jephthah Heyman House project that in 2008 was awarded state and county uh, certificates for excellence in restoration. At the very beginning of a heritage-related collaboration on the Lower Shore, he worked on the application that resulted in official state recognition of the Somerset Register Heritage Area that has grown into the Lower Eastern Shore Heritage Area as we know it today. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the Heritage Award for 2017 goes to Mr. Paul Baker Tourt. Please come forward. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, as Dr. Boger mentioned, I moved here in 83. I was 28 years old, and now I'm 62. So I've spent a long, long time here exploring the deep and rich architectural and historical past of Somerset, Worcester, Wicomico counties, and it's been my honor to have that position and to be able to devote such long-lasting research to the future and preservation of the region's historic resources. Um, thank you for this honor. This brings us to our fifth and final award for the afternoon, and that is the T. O'Connor Heritage Professional Award. This award recognizes an individual, author, archaeologist, architect, exhibits, publication, designer, historian, landscape designer, preservationist, professional staff person, or researcher for significant contributions to the enhancement of local history and or heritage tourism. Our honoree is an incredibly accomplished scholar who has been devoted to the preservation of the history, heritage, and culture on Maryland's eastern shore for nearly half a century. His formidable expertise and knowledge of the Delmarva Peninsula has contributed significantly to our understanding of the region. He co-founded the Edward H. Nabb Research Center for Delmarva History and Culture in 1982, developing that organization into an institutional leader in advancing the preservation and understanding of Delmarva's historical and cultural heritage while serving as a primary source for students, historical organizations, and scholars. His contributions to our local history and heritage tourism are too numerous to mention. Since his recent retirement, he has not been resting on his laurels. Okay? He continues to support the projects, people, and institutions that work to preserve our region's unique culture, joining the Board of Worcester County Library and several other like-minded organizations, and helping the Julia Purnell Museum in Snow Hill evaluate, transcribe, and analyze rare historic documents and photos in the museum's collections. For the 2017 T. O'Connor Heritage Professional Award, uh, this year it goes to Dr. G. Ray Thompson. Dr. Thompson, please come forward. I'd like to uh, thank all of you uh, for being here today and uh, for honoring me in this way. I don't actually know which organization did it because as I look around the uh, room, uh, I've worked with at least 90% of the organizations here, so uh, I think you can say that you all deserve this award. Thank you. to bring forth our featured speaker. Edwin Remsburg attended the University of Maryland College Park where he studied photojournalism. He received recognition for his work in 1987 when his photograph of the Amtrak crash in Chase, Maryland was selected by Life Magazine as one of their pictures of the year and later pictures of the decade. After graduating in 1989, Rimsburg began his career in photography working for the Baltimore Sun. He has since continued his work as a freelance photographer. He has participated in projects such as Maryland Traditions with the Maryland State Arts Council and Maryland's Best with Maryland's Department of Agriculture. Rimsburg has had several bodies of work published, including the illustrations of Baltimore sculpture in Cindy Kelly's book titled Outdoor Sculpture in Baltimore, a historical guide to public art in the Monumental City, and of Maryland Foods in Lucy Snodgrass's cookbook entitled Dishing Up Maryland. He quotes, there is something about our places, our people, and our time that is special. By isolating it and celebrating it, it gives one the ability to appreciate. 
if I can make images that cause people to see their world and themselves in a new way, then I have done my job. Ladies and gentlemen, Edwin Remsberg. I'm Will Hales uh, with Hales Farms uh, here in Salisbury, Maryland, and we uh, grow approximately 300 acres of watermelons. My father uh, started growing seedless watermelons approximately uh, 28 years ago, and I guess I'm third generation in the family farm uh, to grow watermelons. As, as far as uh, watermelons grown here in uh, Maryland and Delaware and on the eastern shore, uh, we feel very strongly that we have the best flavor and the best quality. I think it's a lot better when your uh, your produce uh, or, or whatever it is is grown kind of basically in your backyard because, uh, you know, at least you have a relationship possibly. You might even be in the community with people who know the, the growers of the produce. And uh, maybe you ride by and see the fields and see the guys working hard out there to try to raise the best produce. So we'll start doing our rye strips in November. In March, we'll start tilling the land with a rototiller. Uh, we'll lay our plastic. And then uh, shortly after that, after we, we get all the water hooked up before we plant, we usually try to have the irrigation all ready to roll before we plant our field. And then we'll plant the field most of the time around the, uh, the tail end of April. And then after that, basically every week we'll plant a field and we try to keep our crop spread out. And we'll usually plant al almost every week up until uh, the first part of July. Typically, uh, we'll have anywhere on any given day from from 40 to 60 guys working for us, harvesting and packing the melons. If you've been driving down the road recently and you've seen a, a chopped up school bus, that's that's pretty much the uh, harvesting vehicle of choice. Yeah, you'll see a lot of school buses and the guys will come out in the field and drive down the drive roads and uh, they'll be loading them up. And uh, We eat quite a bit of watermelon, uh, probably a little bit different than most people. The, the way we usually eat it is to get a piece out in the field. So we, we cheat a little bit, but most of the time if we're out here, uh, whether it's checking the irrigation lines or uh, we might be out here spraying or just coming out seeing what's going on with the bees and the pollination or whatever and we'll come out here and if we see one that looks like we need to eat it we'll go ahead and slice it open and uh, most of the time we we eat the heart out of it uh, because we're around them so much and then we'll uh, enjoy that and then we'll roll it over. I guess the uh, the most gratifying thing uh, about growing watermelons uh, probably to me would be uh, when you see small children uh, enjoying a watermelon with their family whether it be a picnic or any type of outdoor activity there's something about kids and watermelon and uh, just kind of seeing the, the young child eating the watermelon with the juice running all down their face onto their T-shirt. That, uh, that's, that's pretty gratifying because uh, most kids are pretty attracted to watermelon and, and love the way it tastes. Uh, so that, that would pretty much be the, the most gratifying thing. And, of course, it's, it's gratifying to see a, you know, a, a well-raised crop. And if you don't have more delicious watermelons in your local grocery store, please ask the uh, produce buyer or the produce manager in the store, if he would uh, do what he could to get you some more delicious watermelons. And uh, after after that happens, I think you'll uh, continue asking for them and uh, returning to purchase them. And that'd be a great help to us, so thanks. So, so, so many of you probably know Will. Um, he's right around the corner here. And I started with that video because it's something we do a lot of. We've done... Um, Oh, I think 380 uh, video clips like that so far on YouTube. And of all of them, that, that one of Will has had more than 4 million viewers. It, it is our most popular uh, video we've ever done, which I think is probably because it's from the lower shore. And for those of you who live down here, you may not realize it, but, realize it, but Will has an accent, which I can hear. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's wonderful. And I think that that accent is as much of the, the sense of place as any of the pictures of the landscape that, here. So he really... For me, it's, it's those sort of profiles of people and, and, and the way people talk and the, the stories they have to share that really tells about not just where they're from, but what, what makes the place they're from special. Um, and so Will's a good example. My number, the number two video in terms of uh, being watched is on Smith Island Cakes. So as you can see, I've done very well by coming to the Lower Shore. It's, it's been good to me. Um, I, st I started out in agriculture growing up on a farm and, and I uh, showed pigs in 4-H and, and, and started out uh, believing I was going to be a farmer and somewhere along the way I decided taking pictures was easier and, and in our house where I, I grew up my grandfather had kept diaries his whole life um, every, every day from 1916 to about uh, 1982 when he died and I had access to all those diaries and I started uh, 
after I picked up the camera, I started going around the farm and taking pictures of the farm and sort of trying to document his life um, that he had recorded in the diaries with my images of, of the place. And that's really how I got started in photography, by, by sort of capturing the stories and the history. Um, and, I, and I'm a big believer, you know, we, we don't throw anything out in, in our family. And, uh, and I'm a very big believer that objects contain stories, that within objects and places and things, they're, they're sort of hidden in them. There's, there's a spirit of story within them that you get from having those objects around. Uh, there was just a, a piece on the, the difficulties of minimalism in uh, the New York <laughs> Times this week. And, uh, and, and, and I'm constantly having people come up to me when, who've seen my, my family background and say, well, I, I, it's amazing that you have so much history. You have so many ancestors and so much family history. And, uh, and I point out that we all basically have the same number of ancestors. <laughs> it's just, you know, some of us have kept our stuff and some of us have thrown it out. We have uh, deaccessioned. And, and in and keeping all that stuff, all that junk, the old, old, old rusty tools, we keep those stories somewhere in the rust, I think, very much. And, and what I do is use a camera to try to, to find the stories and things like that in people. So that's really how I started, was on the farm taking pictures in different seasons and stuff. And this is, you know, this is my other side of the family's grandparents' farm as well. So, so I took that background of farming and started, and really made photographing agriculture primarily what I started doing. Yeah, so you start, we start from the, the agriculture, and it, just, it makes sense that you go from agriculture to culture, like sort of following the whole process through to the, the food part. And that's kind of what I've done. I've, I've, I'm a big believer. I like to say, I tell this people a lot, that you know, if you have deep roots, you can have long branches. You're like a tree. These are my sheep. Actually, I raised raise on my farm. Um, and I went, went from the farm to expanding out into the larger culture around the community and so forth. So when I was at the Baltimore Sun, Early in my career, I would go around to different cultural events and, <laughs> and, and, and do different stories. I was really fascinated by, by the stories that we tell. And, and I have a, a bit of a background in it. I have, a lot of members of my family had done this. This was uh, in, in 1898, my uh, great great aunt Martha Watson got a camera. And for two years, she was a very intense photographer. And this is a, a photograph she took of railroad workers down on the uh, railroad tracks down below our house. Um, <laughs> And, and, it, and what I love about it is, is the ordinariness of it. It's not, a, it's not a birthday, it's not a holiday, it's not Christmas. It is just a very ordinary daily life thing. So I, I became, started doing that myself. This is for my first book, Maryland's Vanishing Lives, um, to try to go around the, the state and, and sort of document and capture things that were vanishing around the state, ways of working and the ways people lived around the state of Maryland. And at that time, I'd come out of the newspaper world, and I was really, I really saw that my job as showing other people what, what goes on, to, to educate and so forth. And we did, we did this book, and then we had a, we had a big ex exhibition after the book was finished at the Baltimore Museum of Industry in Baltimore. And at that exhibition, this guy, Mr. Overman, uh, came to the exhibit, and I don't know if you can see in the, in the picture, but his glasses are about as thick as they could be. In fact, he would work, this was near Johns Hopkins Hospital, he, uh, in this back alley, he made brooms, and he would work in almost complete darkness because he really couldn't see anything, and, uh, and just these, you know, these, these you know, Widowmaker machines flying back and forth all over the place in the dark while he's running, running around making brooms. It was kind of amazing. But what was really cool, when we, we had the exhibit, and, and this picture was on the wall, and he and his, his wife came up, led him up there, and his wife, held onto his arm and, and looked at the picture and pointed the picture to him and, he say, and she said, Howard, I'm so proud of you. And, and for the first time, I kind of I saw that I didn't really necessarily need to educate all of you and all the rest of the world about what he did. I needed to educate people like Howard about how cool it is that they do what they do. And that really, instead of holding up a magnifying glass, I had more to do by holding up a mirror for people. And that, that has really guided me um, in a lot of what I do. It's, it's not necessarily for the rest of the world to see what other people do. That's a nice byproduct, but, but what I'm proudest of is when I can show people how cool they, they really are in other people's eyes. And that, that's really been driving me. So that, that, that's kind of what we do everywhere. This is one of my assistant, Katie, in, in Swaziland. You know? So wherever we go, we, we try to give back more, more than we take. That's really been a sort of guiding principle on how we, take, how we go around and take pictures, is to always try to give back more than we take from people.
and, and that you have fun. So, so celebrate what people love about themselves. And it really, you know, when you, when, you're, when you do things for the right reasons and feel good about what you do, there's, you can go so far. It's really wonderful. This is, this is from the sculpture book, and, and it really, I want to put this in there to point out that context matters. Context is one of the reasons I love to photograph sculpture. I've done two books on sculpture. Um, <laughs> is that, that, that sculpture is really um, made what it is by the context that it appears in. Okay? Sculpture is alive based on what's going on around it. Um, so context for everything matters, not just for sculpture, but for people and places. It, it all has to go together. You know, it all has to relate. Here in Maryland, we start out with the Calverts, and I'm, I'm a lifelong Marylander, and many generations of my family have been in this state, so I'm very, very attached, and it's really what I love. This is uh, Lord Baltimore's home um, in, in England, and we actually, my, I'll make my plug here, we, we run a workshop there in the summer, and you're all welcome. You're all invited, come with me to, to the Lord Baltimore's house, because we do a photography workshop there every summer uh, in July, July 8th to 15th. Come join us, talk to Lena. But, it's a, but what's really cool is this is really you know, where Maryland starts. Mar Maryland starts here in, in northern England in Lord Baltimore's house when uh, Lord Baltimore was given the, the, the grant from Maryland. Um, oops. And, he, and he loads up his boats and comes on over. And he doesn't, doesn't just send people over. They bring with them a lot of culture and a lot of things from England that have influenced us now. So being able to sort of trace back and connect the two has been really, really fun. You know, Another shop in England, leaving the shores. And actually, my, my last ancestor to leave England left in the late 1700s, and I still go visit my cousins over in England when we go over. So we, we've kept that connection. Um, but yeah, they, they sailed on over, and what, what <laughs> becomes Maryland now comes from England back there. Um, and they bring with them these, these English traditions and the, these English ways of doing things. But we are definitely not English anymore. You know, we've, we've gone beyond it. We've taken you know, old ways, new ways, and, and mixed them together and so forth. From beaten biscuits to stuffed ham. And, and, our, and our location, our geography really affects us. You know, whether you're at the bottom of the bay or the top of the bay, you know, it, it's where we are affects what we do. And I, I will warn you that, on average, we do about 250,000 pictures a year, I think, last year. There's a lot of pictures here. I'm going to just run through very, very quickly. <laughs> but, I, but I, but yeah, but, but you know, this, this place, this sense of place is very important to me. And it's something I think everyone needs. Because um, we are informed by, you know, where we come from. Our, our roots make our branches possible. And, and this idea that you need identity for, for is, is very important. And it's very, very key right now. I think right now there's, you know, with this, the, the, the move against globalization really points up how much people need an identity to hold on to and how universal it is. This is, this is King Mtswati III of Swaziland, who um, is the last absolute monarch in Africa. And, and he likes me, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, for, but, um, you know, Mitswati's a bit of a pig. He's kind of a, what's a terrible thing to say, but, but he is, he, you know, he drives a Rolls Royce. He goes to Las Vegas. He's in one of the poorest countries in Africa um, with, a 20, with the highest AIDS rate in the world, 25% uh, rate of AIDS in, in Swaziland. Um, and every year, they do a, he does a thing called the Umhalunga Reed Dance where he brings every, uh, in this case, about 100,000 childless, unmarried women into a stadium, and he picks a new wife that he adds oh an, another wife. God. So, uh, so we, we went there, and, uh, this is 2015, to, to, to photograph this and so forth, and, and fully expecting, and I was fully expecting there to be a lot of uh, discontent within that community, because he doesn't sound like the most generous, enlightened, and progressive person in the world. Instead, what we found is that Matswati's a rock star. They love Matswati, um, and they and 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 they all acknowledge that, that a lot of the things in in the way Matswati rules are are sort of nasty and, and not desirable. But they're they're their nasty. It's it's their own culture, and the and the sense that they're more proud of the fact that they have their own unique culture 
than they are of the, in, of the individual problems with it, really struck me. I was really surprised at how, how, much, how, how much pride there was in being Swazi, in having a unique culture, in being different from the rest of the world, in being their own selves. And I think we see that in our own country now to some extent, uh, that it's, it's more important, that identity is more important than fairness or, or rightness. It's, it's the sense of being someone, knowing who you are, and that the search for, your, for yourself and your identity and your place in the world. And, I'm, and like I say, I do a lot of work in England, and I saw that with the Brexit thing. The Brexit thing, you know, made no sense to a lot of people. But you know, we're not just seeing things happening in our own country. This is this is a universal thing that happens in every culture in every country. The the idea that you want you to have your own identity and know who you are and where you came from. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is you know, like I say, it's it's very universal. This is at the reed dance. Oh my God, there. All the maidens bring reeds to, to give to the queen mother. Um, but I took this picture uh, not 24 hours after I took this picture, which is the, uh, the, the horse guards at Buckingham Palace, you know, bringing, bringing the, uh, the equines to the queen mother. So, uh, so it's all very universal. I'm constantly struck by that, that there's, there's, as much as we might think different things are unique, they really often fit into patterns that repeat in every culture. This is, this is jaggery making in uh, Punjab, India, um, which is a uh, sugar cane boiled down to make uh, sugar cakes. Um, it's almost identically to, identical to maple syrup making in Western Maryland, Leo Shindle, in Allegheny County. Or, uh, or in Maine, this is about maple syrup boiling in Maine. Here's the, the tombs of the kings here near Memphis uh, in, in Egypt. If you haven't been to Cairo, it's wonderful. The Tomb of the King in Memphis. <laughs> Those were taken about a week apart. So, uh, Portland, Oregon, the coast of, coast of Portland, Oregon, and the coast of Portland, Maine. Uh, There's there a lot of universal truths. This is the, you know, the, the Roman Forum in, uh, in Rome. The, and, uh, and the Marina dis District in Dubai right now, sort of our gleaming, shining cities. They, they just, the patterns repeat, repeat both over time and space in so many ways. So I'm constantly, you know, with all this sort of, these, these repeating patterns, we look for difference because sameness is, is sort of accepted. You know, and I spend a lot of time just photographing places, Jacksonville, Florida, again back in England, Baltimore. My own, this is my truck in Africa, in <laughs> Alaska. I do a lot. Of, I work with the University of Alaska. It's one of my big clients that we do a lot of work with. And to Kansas, Kansas City, and, and uh, New Delhi. <laughs> and there, there's a, you try to a lot of what we do in, photogra in uh, photography, especially, is romanticized places. This is Whitby Abbey in in England. It's where Dracula takes place. You know, Dracula kills Lucy right behind the, the Abbey um, in, in the novel. Uh, but, the, but, you know, we, we make these very romantic places. But the reality is mo most places are just full of people and kind of not that pleasant. Um, this is the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal is a great place to see people. It's a terrible place to see Islamic architecture. And so, so I've really been fascinated by crowds and people and how how people interact with these spaces and so forth. This is the, the um, in Rome again. And, and right this year in particular, I've been photographing a lot of markets, a lot of, a lot of uh, public markets have, have become a fascinating for me and the way people interact with each other and, and with the, the things that matter to them and are important to them within the public market. This is the Mutra Souk in, uh, in Oman, at the Persian Gulf. Oman's one of my favorite countries in the world. Uh, this is the, the Mercado in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, which is the largest market in Africa. It just goes on for miles and miles. And uh, the, the Khan in uh, Cairo. And this is in Japur, India. So th th I, I love this idea of universal patterns being seen in every place, but also the sense of that at the same time you see these differences. Or you know, Temple Bar in Dublin. Or, or Cecil County, Maryland, <laughs> a different kind of bar. 
And this is the, the Lori Festival in Punjab at, at a private house. And, and a very small picnic in, this is Oman, the Masadam Peninsula, in the Persian Gulf. And of course, the, the, the Forbidden City in China, lots and lots of people, 80,000 people a day come through these gates. Uh, China is a, a lot of fun and very interesting. Um, you know, we, we sort of, again, we go back, we, we tend to romanticize and, uh, and isolate places, but I think the, the context is really neat. In working with Maryland traditions, I, we, we work with a lot of people who come from other cultures of the world and bring their culture with them. And it's very interesting that, that the culture they bring is also very pure and pared down. So this is a, a Chinese calligrapher in Montgomery County, Maryland, who had, you know, this very clean, pure sense of, of, uh, of Chinese design and culture. In Beijing, it's very messy and electric and, and modern. <laughs> so, uh, so you can always, sometimes I'm, I'm very fascinated, but sometimes you find the more pure I incarnation in, in the diaspora than you do in, in the place where it came from. And I love this picture. This is from the night market the, uh, in, in Beijing, uh, which is a great place. Um, but I, I want you to notice, uh, I want you to notice that the t-shirt in the background. I, I, I love cultural appropriation. I think p cultural appropriation is a great thing. And I know lots of uh, people talk terrible things about it. But what I love about it is you see it in every culture. You see everyone appropriating from everyone else everywhere. It is not, it is not a one-way street or there's no, there's no particular one. It is not always like you know, some terrible dominant culture preying upon those poor cultures. It happens everywhere. It happens in every culture universally. Uh, she's eating, I think, an octopus, and I think he's got scorpion back there. And uh, yeah, the, 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 it's the, the best street food on the planet is, Be is in Beijing. If you go to the Beijing night market, there's this whole district where, where these little shops, it's, if you ever watch Blade Runner, it is, it is Blade Runner come to life. So, you know, even within Maryland, we can, we can look at some cultural appropriation in the sense that, you know, Maryland, you know, we think of Old Bay as being very Maryland, but, you know, Old Bay is, is, is the product of a, of a German immigrant, a Jewish German immigrant for around World War II. It is not an ancient thing that came sprung fully formed out of the soil of the Chesapeake Bay. It, it, is, it is, you know, it is Eastern European sausage spice. And, uh, and what, what makes it, our culture doesn't have to be pure or stay pure. Um, this is the, 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 the spice market in, in Delhi, India, with the largest spice market in the world, uh, Korobori Road, I believe it's pronounced. Um, and, and, and I think spice is a good analogy because, you know, if you, if you all these are wonderful spices, but you don't want a great big pure spoonful of any of them. Um, <laughs> But you mix them together and put them with other things and you get something that's delicious and, and wonderful. And I think culture is the same way. If you, keep, if you work so hard to keep your culture pure, I, I'm not sure that, that it ever grows. But when you start mixing things together, you get something wonderful and amazing. But, it, but just, just like a spice, you want to you know where, it, you want to be able to taste individually where it came from. You don't want to lose all the flavor, but you don't want to isolate it so much that you lose, lose the banquet. So I, so I like mixing things up. These are Tibetans with uh, cell phones. This is the Ngoni, the uh, traditional West African Ngoni, which becomes the banjo when it comes to Baltimore. And I think you know, Native American culture is very fascinating to me because you know, what, what we think of as, uh, as Native American culture doesn't have to be frozen in time in, in 1491. It continues to grow and, 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 and become alive and change as, as time progresses. And so, so, I, so I like appropriation and I, I like when people uh, enjoy culture and share it. No matter what it is, uh, you know, we, we need some sort of identity. This is, these are Amish in Western Maryland. <laughs> and then I'll show you di different Maryland things. So, so a, lot, a lot of it's, you know, I photograph the people and what they do and, and in the people I hope you can see and and when we record here, the stories of who they are and where they came from and what they bring with them. I'll try to include some local heroes. <laughs> Bill Kirkson, who uh, he's 
the, the song Hot Rod Lincoln he plays guitar on. Lefty Cray, who's the, the, the god of fly fishing. Some of these. But there's, just to give you a sense of people and culture that I, that I love to photograph. And many of these are from the Maryland Traditions program. So. And others are from a lot of the work I do with, with farmers and agriculture, which is <laughs> number two on our YouTube list. <laughs> and all sorts of hunters, gatherers, and, and, the, and the royalty associated with them. But yeah, pl place matters. Um, I should probably wrap up with place. And that's a, uh, this was a tree apple volcano in, in Colombia before. This is the, the Sasasfle in, in Namibia. So we were just in Namibia last month. Alaska, again, where I do a lot of work. Um, and, and Africa. I try to get to Africa as much as possible because I adore. This is Victoria Falls. And Patagonia in Chile. So the place matters. This is, this is the Palouse in, in uh, eastern Washington State. One of my favorite places to take pictures of, actually. The, the Palouse. In South Africa, the Middle East, but this is the Persian Gulf in Oman. The place, place matters. This is how I travel for a lot of places, either get rent or buy a truck, and, or just go in and buy a tent and head out. So I get to go, get to go see a lot of the world and do a lot of things, and, uh, and I enjoy it quite a bit. So let me show you, show you what I'm doing in the rest of the world since I showed you a lot of Maryland. This is some of the African work we do. A lot of, a lot of the work I do in Africa revolves around development. Um, in particular, this is Ethiopia project I'm working on with fertilizer. Mopani worms, which are like insect flavored Cheetos. <laughs> they, 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 they crunch beautifully. <laughs> But that, that, that's in Botswana. Botswana has done a wonderful job of doing uh, cultural heritage villages, where they, they've sort of, you know, they've sort of fi found a way to monetize traditional culture in a way that keeps it sustainable and keeps villages sustainable that might not be otherwise U using culture and history as, as an economic vehicle. Wow. That's this Lesotho, the highest country in the world. And right now, what I, what I have working on next, if you're going to fo follow what's going on now, I'm doing a lot of work with coffee at the moment. So this is, this is Costa Rica, the coffee harvest. Um, I'm working on sort of an extended project on the culture of coffee and how coffee is produced around the world. Ethiopia. Yeah. And, and my private project that I'm working on is I'm secretly obsessed with camels. I love camels. So I will end with a few camel pictures uh, to, to, to send you on your journey. Um, because the camel is the only animal that you can do everything with. You can eat a camel, you can ride a camel, you can milk a camel, you can race a camel, you can pull a cart with a camel. Everything an animal can do is, as it's often said, the camel is a horse designed by committee. They, <laughs> It can do everything you want done. <laughs> this is the largest camel market in the world in, in uh, UAE, in the United Arab Emirates, right there, the, where Saudi Arabia and UAE and Oman meet. So, <laughs> oops, in Egypt, camels. So yeah, ca camels are, I just think camels are fascinating. So, so with that, I will, I will end with a push. <laughs> and thank you all. My name is Chad Buderbaugh. I am the director of Maryland Traditions, and that is our state folk life program. Folk life just refers to, hi Elaine, <laughs> living cultural traditions. And uh, as the state in the union, which has had a folklorist working on behalf of Maryland since 1974, we are the longest continuously running state folk life program at that. And I'm very proud and privileged to count Dr. Elaine F. as one of my predecessors and mentors and Edwin Remsberg as a colleague, uh, some of you might be asking yourselves if he is, in fact, the most interesting person in the world. He is. <laughs>
So I encourage you to um, take advantage of the afternoon and come and say hello to him and ask him a few questions about his work after we uh, finish up today. At Maryland Tradition, since 2001, we have been grant makers to artists and tradition bearers in the folk arts. And one of our signature events each year is sort of the state version of this event. The Maryland Traditions Heritage Awards are given out annually in three categories, person, tradition, and place. As Edwin says, place matters, and indeed, we agree. And so once a year, we locate a place in the state of Maryland, which has been an outstanding advocate or steward of traditional arts and culture. The Trimper family of Ocean City, Maryland, were the recipients of the Place Award in 2016. There have been Trimpers on the Eastern Shore of Maryland since 1893 and they have run their family owned and operated amusement park Trimper's Rides since that time. It's grown of course and changed over the years but they have been in that location doing their good work uh, since the late 19th century. We honored the Trimper family in uh, Silver Spring in November at our State Heritage Awards ceremony but we wanted to recognize them as well on their home turf so to speak uh, and so we were able to gather a few representatives of the family and friends today uh, who will speak to you in just a few minutes. But before that, uh, as part of our work with the Trimpers last year, we produced a short documentary. Uh, so I'd like to invite you all to uh, enjoy yourselves uh, as we get a look at this place which is so crucial and important to Maryland folk life. I'm Stephanie Trimper Lewis. I'm a fourth generation Trimper here in Ocean City. We're standing inside the amusement park now that um, my great grandfather started in 1890 when he came from Baltimore. I've worked here my whole life from age 10 selling tickets until now. Um, I have four children that work here and along with my nephews and nieces and sister and brother and so it's just a, a family tradition to work here as well as an honor. My great-grandfather and grandmother came uh, from Baltimore. They were German immigrants. They had a, a bar in Baltimore and a silver dollar saloon and they came and visited in Ocean City in the early days and loved it and so they decided to pack up their family, dogs, everything, and move to Ocean City. And Ocean City was very, very quiet at that time. There were not very many businesses, very few homes. It was difficult to get over here. And I can just imagine that he just saw the possibilities in the place. And it really created the whole entertainment section of the boardwalk and actually was one of the original people that actually put the boards out each night and took them in. I think one of the more remarkable things that has carried into the family today is a tenacity. There were many, many storms that caused all these hotels to be blown down and he had to rebuild again and again and he did. And that not giving up, not giving up on Ocean City, not giving up on his dreams I think was one of the qualities that, like I say, the family has today of what more can we do? What can we add? They bought one of the old hotels here, the Seabright, and um, eventually added another hotel. And then when I guess my grandfather was bored with that, he started to add entertainment venues. Uh, I remember my father telling me about uh, on the boardwalk, there used to be a giant alligator viewing pad that you could see along with a roller rink and things that are long gone now. The grandest ride that he bought was our 1912 Herschel Spillman carousel. It's a menagerie carousel in that it's not just horses, it's all different kinds of animals. Uh, and one mythical animal, we have a sea monster. The rest of them are goats and giraffe and zebras and also dogs and cats and pigs and it's one of the longest operating in the same place. It's a just a 
beautiful piece of art, American immigrants coming here, part of America, a true American story. My grandfather added different kitty rides in the 1920s and 30s. And in the 1960s, my father decided to add outdoor rides. In the 80s, we got our roller coaster, the tidal wave, which was a big deal then, and we still have it running today. This is the oldest family operating amusement park in the entire world. It's important because they're keeping on a family tradition of joy and fun and smiles and happiness, which you very rarely find in this day and age. You can come in here, you can be a big kid, you can be a little kid, you can play a game, win a prize, ride a ride, have some screens, laugh, pop balloons, run around like a little kid and just be yourself. Daniel Trimper, his wife and his family, came here with just a dream. And this is what their dream became. 124 years later, this is what their dream became and it's still here. Trimpers is a, sort of a magical place. Something about it just sticks with you. A lot of the family members were born and raised here, but there's a lot of us that have come here and it's got into us as well. And I'm confessed to being one of those. Um, I've worked here for on and off about 20 years. Yeah, fell in love and stayed. In love with the park, that is. I've been here for 22 years and I've literally seen two and three generations since I've been here. It's a legacy and a tradition that would literally be lost and would probably not only hurt my heart, but a lot of other people. This is the core of downtown. This is the core of the boardwalk. This is why you come to the boardwalk, is to see the twinkling lights and hear the kids laughing and the screams. The amazing part of Trimpers is that we constantly get emails and letters about how uh, people are bringing their grandchildren to ride rides that they rode when they were children. So it means so much to the families that we're here because it's, it's tradition to them. The letters and all that we get are so heartfelt. It's really cool how through the years people just still love it. If Trimpers was to close, not oh my God, not, please don't ever say close. that. If Trimpers were to ever close, I believe a part of the world would be lost, to be honest, because you have to think if this is the oldest family operating amusement park in the world, they must be doing something right. From Trimper's Rides of Ocean City, please make welcome Johnny Jett, Monica Thrash, and Stephanie Trimper Lewis. Um, good afternoon. Uh, when we um, went to Montgomery County, County to accept this honor, uh, I was honest with the audience. I didn't even know that there was such a traditions honor, so it was all new to me. So I quickly looked it up and um, looked at the past honorees that we were joining, and it really came close to my heart when I saw that the Sharptown Carnival, Fireman's Carnival tradition had been honored. Because it was there in the 1940s that my um, father, Granville, while running his Ferris wheel, fell in love with a little girl that lived across the street from the carnival ground. And I guess um, the rest is um, my history, as you say. Um, when I was uh, after the awards, I mingled around um, in the audience, and uh, people came to me and said uh, things like, uh, I didn't even know you all had an old carousel down there. That would be cool to see. Or, I didn't even know there was an amusement park at that end of town. 
And some were even, uh, these Marylanders said, I've, I've never even been to Ocean City. <laughs> so I was this little Ocean City girl. I was just horrified. I, I was so humbled. I, I thought we were a big deal, you know. Uh, <laughs> so of course I invited them all to come and uh, they all assured me they would. Um, but uh, last year when we found out that we had been designated as um, definitely the uh, oldest single-family amusement park, single-family run and own and operated amusement park in America, we were thrilled. Um, I mean, who would have thought? We didn't know. We, <laughs> we're just down there on that last three blocks of Ocean City doing our thing. Um, but uh, I wish the rest of Maryland knew so that they could come and, uh, and see us. But I often wish um, that my great-grandfather could just um, come down, uh, maybe a nice night in July, uh, about 10 o'clock, and um, walk around those three blocks and see what his dream has become. Because I really hope that he would be proud. Um, we're going to try to keep r those rides spinning in circles around down there for another hundred years. Uh, it's hard. It, it's hard to keep it profitable down there, um, but we're, you know, we're going to do it. Uh, and I'm hoping that in a hundred years that um, I, my great-grandchildren will be here and wondering <coughs> if I'm proud of what they've done, and I assure you I will be. So um, I just want to thank whoever was involved in nominating us uh, for the award and all of you that promote us or support us or even if you just make uh, Trimper's Rides part of your own family's summer vacation, it means a lot to us and um, I hope to see you all down there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I have to tell you just how excited I have been here to be uh, with you for this invitation. I appreciate the invitation. The reason I wanted just to take a, a, a couple minutes is um, this honor that Trimpers received is huge. And this event that um, you sponsored um, in November where Trimpers was recognized as a Maryland tradition you know, I just want everybody to think about this, that this is truly international recognition. You know, to be the longest continuing family amusement operation in the entire world. And those of you who have been there, you know that Trimpers is a magical place. And for some of us, it's family. Um, I'm here um, at Lisa's invitation, but also the fact that I have Stephanie Trimper and our families have been dear friends for years and years growing up, Johnny Jett, my mother, working together. And so, you know, this is a, this award is one that all of us should take great pride in. And I was thrilled that um, in the November um, ceremony up in Montgomery County, where we were educating the rest of the state about Trimpers, <laughs> that Governor Hogan uh, made a point to have a citation presented, a statewide citation pre presented um, to the entire Trimper family and organization team and Stephanie accepting that. And I also want to point out that um, Governor Hogan actually spends time uh, at Trimpers uh, having a place downtown and Stephanie and the governor uh, walking on the boardwalk going into Trimpers is one of the fondest memories I'll ever have. So I just really, Stephanie's very, very, Stephanie's very humble about her family's success. Um, it's a very giving and caring family and family business that they've continued that tradition and really wanted to just take um, a couple minutes here and really recognize um, this achievement and everything they've done for our community and our state. So Stephanie. just a couple of quick items here to um, remind you of some of the uh, products and services that uh, LESH supports. 
One, of course, is the, uh, the new Blue Crab app. You got to all get this. You all have uh, cell phones, I'm sure. So, you know, get this one, help you move around there. We also do the uh, Art and Times Quarterly, a brochure that uh, we partner with uh, Worcester County uh, Tourism to make this one happen. Of course, we're, uh, there's a Lesh Facebook page and the Lesh website, loreshoreheritage.org. Uh, we certainly have to make mention of our newest initiative, and that is uh, a, a new addition to the Lesh Certified Heritage Area. It includes the uh, Village of Allens. Any representative? Right. Yes, of course, from yeah. Village of Allen. Welcome. Please, uh, let's recognize the Village of Allen as um, a new addition to a heritage area. Uh, the area includes the Upper Ferry all the way down to the border of Wicomico, uh, including the Borderlow Winery area as well. So we're just so delighted to, to um, have that happen. And uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention, before, before we wrap up here, a uh, very important development in our heritage area next door. And that, of course, is the opening of the Mary Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Park Visitor Center and Museum. I had to write that down there because that's a lot of stuff there. Uh, but that is so important. Um, one of my colleagues referred to uh, that development as what is going to become the Yellowstone of the Eastern Shore. That's what she says, you know. And if that's the case, we're all water people, boat people, so we know that a rising tide lifts all boats. So uh, we're just waiting to see that uh, develop. Someone today mentioned, yes, as soon as uh, Harriet appears on the $20, $10 bill, whatever bill it is, that's going to kick that up to, a, to another level. So we'd be remiss if we did not mention that development here today. 